Greetings, Slashaholics. This is David Bergantino, author of the book Wes Craven's New Nightmare, the Bard's Blood Horror Shakespeare series, and the writer-designer of horror video game Return, One Way Trip. You're listening to the 80s slasher librarian's narration of my books in the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror series. Prepare to be scared. Hello Slashaholics, be sure to subscribe, click that like button, and click that bell. Also check out the companion channel, the 80s Slasher Library After Hours, for all the great podcast and original content. Links are in the description below. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. You can find those links in the description below as well, as well as our merch store and the Patreon page. You can support the channel for as low as $2 per month, get some great stuff like free ebooks, free merch, voice a character, and an audiobook narration, and so much more. Tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. That's Tyrone Kennard, Nick Velcarve, Jeffrey Quick, Daniel Mackey, David Arnold, Alex Vanover, Krista Campbell, Rob Davey, Jay Gardner, Willow Ravenwood, Lauren Vaught, Kristen Kay, Michael, William Schaefer, Liam Anderson, Bree, Bonanza, Jellybean, Ryan Woodward, Allison Seib, Iron Alexa, Hawaii, Cecilia Spears, Sean Campbell, Catherine McClear, Tony DeVore, Seminole and Carl Eakins. And thank you so much for supporting the channel. I couldn't do it without you. Good evening, Slashaholics. Welcome to episode 18 of Out of Print Slashers. I am Sean Campbell. I am here with the 80s Slasher Librarian, Josh LaRue. How you doing tonight? Pretty good. You had to think about it there for a second. What's his <laughs> I name? I was like, uh, 18, 80. Uh... All right. And we have a special guest tonight. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. I am David Bergantino, the author of Deadly Disguise. Awesome. Yes, uh, it's weird that we're doing the last book in the series as our first book covered on the channel. Uh, but the reason I picked this one is because whenever I have all the books. I'm going to narrate all of them, like we talked about. But this was the most intriguing cover and plot synopsis for me. When I saw him, and I talked to you about that uh, before I narrated it, and uh, it was just a really cool story, and this was actually the last one you wrote for the entire series, right? Correct. This is your last Freddy book? Yeah, that, the last Freddy book I wrote, yep. Yep. Um, this is interesting because it's part of the, the young adult uh, series, which kind of like Friday the 13th, the series we've done before by William Pattison, those involved... Jason's hockey mask possessing different people, and in this case, it's kind of a similar device. And yeah, I was kind of weirded out by it at first because I didn't know how that was going to play out. But I read this book, and it, it was fun. It was intriguing. There were twists around every corner. I mean, don't let the young adult moniker fool you. I mean, th- these are really good books. There's a, there's a negative stigma around young adult, but honestly, there's nothing in here I didn't like or wouldn't have what would have. I would have liked to have seen all this in the movies, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Do you, do you, you, I've got the, the color version of the covers. This is how even the publishers viewed young adult books at the time. The reason the colors are the covers are so colorful is because these books were actually made and designed to go into libraries so that kids would go to libraries and see them first. Because okay. they had the bright colors. That's why that's why YA books at the time had just garish colors. It was just to attract kids. This looks like goosebumps to me. Mm-hmm. The way I see these young adult Freddy books and Jason books and Halloween books is really good stories without all the unnecessary filler that we get with, like, the Black Flames Oh, books absolutely. Because, um, honestly, those books... There's really no difference as far as young adult content and the adult content between the two. Um, there's kills in these books. There's, you know, uh, adult situations in these books. I mean, there's innuendo, uh, obviously. Um, hell, there's a couple guys in this book that are, are trying to rob this place blind, you know. And I cannot wait to talk about them because they're not, they're like my two favorite characters in this book. They're the wet bandits of Freddy's Playhouse. Exactly, you know. I, I just picture Freddy setting little uh, Kevin McAllister traps for him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did enjoy the little bits of Freddy because there was little hints throughout the book. Uh, speaking of which, before we go any further, spoiler warning, um, 
we're not going to be able to hold anything back as far as story goes. So if you have not read this book or listened to this book, uh, you can you should do that first. Uh, you can hear it on the channel right now, or you. What was it last time you saw? It? How much did it cost for a copy, David? Uh, when you looked it up, thirty-five hundred dollars. A steal. Yeah. A steal, I tell you. Steal. At thirty-five hundred dollars. <laughs> So, yeah, you can listen to it on the channel or pay some price gouger. That is a huge amount of money right there. Um, but it's, it's, it's a short, it's a short, it's probably the shortest one out of them, but it's got the most meat of them. Uh, I actually read the first two that weren't written by David and like in my free time. And man, wow, that guy just goes on and on um, about nothing. And you get to the point, and that's what I appreciate with your storytelling. Because um, this story, you jump right into it, you know. This, uh, Sean, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm taking your job here. You go ahead. <laughs> that's all go. good. This, it it kind of is... starts out with a, kind of a Tales from the Crypt vibe, where Freddy is narrating oh. about the story he's about to unfold for Halloween. This is because, you know, we've, we've never seen a Nightmare on Elm Street on Halloween, not that I'm aware of. So it's interesting to see how he would do it because obviously he wants to go into the the tricks, the disguises, and that's kind of what plays into this book. And it sets up the story of a big party where everyone's going to come to it. And unlike what was it, uh, old the old Myers place where they talk about a party and nothing really happens at the party. Yeah. It was like really, I don't know where they were going with that. But this stuff does go down at this party. This mysterious man that used to be a child in elm street leaves goes to hollywood changes his name from john appleby to jack spider the jack spider. big hollywood name and he comes back and no one's seen him in years there's rumor he's disfigured there's rumors that he you know got messed up in a fire that he's gone crazy and now everyone wants to see him and you're wondering what's going to happen at this party there's interesting characters there is rachel the main character who knew Jack, when he was a kid and wants to see what he's like as an adult, um, you have a whole cast of characters. You have uh, Jack's bodyguard and best friend Ron, who you know you don't you don't know if there's some evil intent behind him. There's Maria, the hostess. There is um, was it Veronica? I think it was Veronica, the one that's the the scorned girlfriend from Hollywood. There's all these characters, and you're wondering is one, does one of them have something nefarious? Uh, it's a powder the scene. Absolutely, just all these characters mixed around. It's it's Freddy Krueger by way of Agatha Christie. Yes. <laughs> Go. Uh, I, and I was gonna say because uh, I, I I totally skimmed over the Freddy Krueger introduction. Uh, definitely enjoyed that of these books. Uh, because it is kind of like having the Crypt Keeper there introducing the stories. It kind of give it, it kind of gave me uh, Freddy's Nightmares kind of a vibe, but in book form, um, which is probably a pretty good comparison. Uh, although the books are really fun, and most of those episodes of that TV show were really bad. Yeah, I just saw uh, Brad Pitt in one of those episodes. I'm like, what? Right? <laughs> I'm just trying the, to watch a couple of those. The, the Freddy parts are great, and uh, what was it like he? Uh, I'm trying to remember the costume. I cannot remember for the life of me, but he's like naming off different costumes saying, ooh, that's creepy or something. Then it's it's like something that's not scary at all. And he's like, now that's real scary. Uh, my point is you did a really good job of like how Freddy would do it. You know, like a, not, not necessarily a whimsical Freddy, uh, but like a host Freddy, you know, hosting this story. And uh, there, if you pay attention, there are little bits of Freddy that pop out of these the certain characters that we'll talk about as we go along. Um, so what was your inspiration for this particular story? And was it one that you were purposely saving as the last one or? Um, no, I, I, I was writing them pretty much one at a time. Like I, I got the, I, I got the, the deal to write all the books without having to write synopses. Uh, because okay. New Nightmare had done so well, they were just like, "Boom, we need you on these." We didn't like the other author. Do something with this. And so, I think the only thing I, I really had to pitch maybe was the very first book, and and that was just to have the hook of of what the title became, you know, the virtual terror aspect of it. For this, it's now months later. I'm kind of tired. It's, it's, this is not my fourth book. You get 
tired trying to do, especially with these these intros. It's this it becomes this formula and becomes a little bit rote. Um, and you know, this is back when I was I was young and and kind of kind of you know not not so settled. So I was I was kind of not in a great uh, time uh, <laughs> period of time. Uh, life in my mind and I was just like I just want to get this thing over with yeah. I know I'll do a Hollywood action film that's what I'll do and that's that was the, the the guiding light for this book was to to take the concept and do something different the others are a little bit more psychological horror you know situational this I just right off the bat I want this to be a Hollywood action film that's what I'm gonna do and anybody watching the other ones that he wrote, I'm going to be doing back to back to back as a special October, uh, like Halloween type thing on the channel. So it's going to be a month of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I noticed is um, Freddy's not in a rush in this one because in the other Freddy books we've read, he's always trying to rush and get something done to get a big plot done. But in this one, he's kind of, he's laid back. He's having fun. Mm. He's telling a story. And it's nice to see Freddy relaxed a little bit, just having fun. <laughs> and it, it's fun to try to guess who Freddy is in these two. You know, it's like, it's, it's like a whodunit thing. Um, but I got to say, I was really thrown by the Jack Spider revelation on the disfigurement, you know? Yeah, so that, that was that was a pretty because that threw me because I thought that was going to be like a plot device for like a big chunk of the book, mm -hmm. and uh, when he makes his appearance and it's you know just takes it off, uh, that caught me off guard because that's what everybody was kind of talking about before he showed up. He got you formed. Know? He's been, he's this monster living in the catacombs. Just right. Like, none of that happened. None of that happened. Yeah, and and that was you know I think I think this also is reflective of what I was saying about about my state of mind when I, I wrote it. I'm, I'm in Hollywood and I wrote it while I was here and I was just starting in video games and I'm starting to really see, you know, as a Midwestern boy transplanted, you know, into Hollywood, I'm starting to see all this and all of this completely overblown made up melodrama around all these people. Now, meanwhile, I had, had my own little semi-famous life in New York already, hanging out with the cast of Saturday Night Live. I knew all these famous people. I slept in the in their offices, so I knew that even big famous people could be normal. And and then I get here, and I'm seeing mostly all of the all of the crap that that all, all, all that everybody else sees. I'm just like, uh, I'm tired of this stuff. So that's part of why that part's in the book was okay. I was I really wanted that to be a twist of nope this is all this is this is all all made up this is just you guys you know uh just fretting over over one tiny little thing you may have heard at some point and then that throws everything that throws everybody off that's it and that's what it was there for to throw you off awesome I like that explanation a lot that makes a lot of sense that was some really good misdirection there um now, for anybody that doesn't know, there's a reason, as David's told me, uh, and he said so in another interview, uh, why, why, why the possession angle is the Freddy plotline and why Freddy isn't a big part of the story till towards the end. That was something the publishers, that was like one of their roles, right? Yes, and yes, they it sort of, and I remember the, 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 uh, Patterson books and and the mask business because I was trying to I wanted to get one of those <laughs> okay. one of those books um, and um, and they were like we don't Freddie can't be in it <laughs> Freddie books but Freddie can't be in it because they want didn't want anything to mess with the mythology yeah. and the more Freddie is in it and in, and and motivating the story overtly the more opportunity there is to mess with the timeline and mess with with the mythology so they said give them a crypt keeper opening and close and make it a shell game you know wonder where freddie is but focus on the characters of the story and not freddie himself like, okay and that was the formula i'm still laughing at that because i'm like you do realize in the fifth one Freddie resurrected his ghost mom to re-give birth to himself, and they didn't want to mess with that strong 
Hotline. Okay. Oh, okay. the fifth uh, movie. Yes, yes. Well, Dream they are allowed to do whatever they want. It's it's yeah. it's us random. You know, look. This is this is a this is a marketing tool for them. It's not part of their 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 yeah. main focus. So so they they put these really strict rules on this. You well, know, but it works. Which, which frankly, I'm happy with rules like this because it it you have to be clever then to make something interesting out of this. If your your main character, the one that everybody's expecting to see, isn't even in the book. And that's that's what I was going to say. That that makes it even better because you it because I, I don't know. At least for me, I love like murder mysteries and the whodunits and. Uh, Having Freddie Moore as a background player until the end makes the makes the build up better and the payoff better because uh, you you were given more leeway with Freddie. Uh, William couldn't even use Jason at all, you know, uh, and and at least they they allowed you guys to uh, for the intro, the outro, and a little bit towards the end of the book. Um, but going into this one, when I started reading it, and because I, I really thought it was going to be like a phantom of the opera type thing you know and after that that switcheroo i gotta honestly say my favorite characters became the two guys that decided <laughs> to crash the party and uh came to rob them sean can we talk about them oh absolutely it was um it was todd and van yes. and one of them's like I, i'm the leader i say what we do and the other one's like okay but what do we do this you know it kind of, it kind of reminded me of um that Disney movie, The Aristocats, the two junkyard dogs that are just like, yes. I'm the leader. I say what we do. You can be replaced. You know, and then the other was the Basset Hound and the the side by side of the motorcycle. Just I, I I saw those in the thieves as they were going. And like you said, they were the most interesting characters because they kept going like, man, I don't want to be up here, Robin. I want to go to the party. It's like there'll be plenty of parties. What they're never gonna let us get away with this, you know? <laughs> just uh, and uh, they're. What happened to them was pretty messed up, you know. Just we we can talk about it. We gave a spoiler warning. Let's talk about it because uh, yeah. they, they get they get a pretty they get a pretty good ending. And see, that was a good switcheroo because one of them gets his arms caught in a dumb waiter, and you think that his arms are going to get ripped off, but then someone takes advantage of that situation to like suffocate him from behind. And I just I was not I wasn't expecting that. And then the other one to get attacked by the polar bear, the stuffed polar bear in the <laughs> yes, attic. Just, holy hell! Bear. I love the scene with the stuffed polar bear. Uh, because the moment when it's falling on him, he has a flashback to his dad giving him some bear advice or something. And then it yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the misdirection in this book. Because that Sean brought it up. That's another good point. Because that's what you're thinking, that this dumbwaiter is going to rip his arms off. Uh, you know, and again, we get a switcheroo. We get misdirection. And it really feels like one of those classic whodunit murder mysteries, you know. Uh which one of my favorites, Clue, but that's a topic for another day. I love that movie. Yeah. Oh, my God. Right. Uh, I might talk about that on After the Slash a bit because uh, we'll probably do some comparisons. Um, when you wrote those characters, the, the thieves, because, like, in my head, I almost pictured them, like, Pinky in the brain, but just, just Pinky and Pinky. Um, <laughs> like, uh, were you basing them off of any, uh, you know, characters from uh, – movies you had seen or people you have known or anything I, like that? I think generally speaking, I was sort of, uh, I think, I think it, they were sort of like some combination of Jay and Silent Bob and, yeah. and um, picking the brain and just that kind of dynamic of, because <laughs> it's also, but those two characters sort of are, are very different from the rest of the characters of the party. Yeah. And so I wanted, especially with the way I was, I was making the other characters at this, this height of melodrama, um, I wanted to have these, these, this pressure valve of the story and have comic relief show up every so often. And I don't know, I, I don't know, I just came up, these guys, these two characters came up, it was, they're the kind of characters that write themselves. Yeah. With so, their yeah. dynamics and, their, and the, way, the, the way they spoke to each other. And I, I, I hadn't read the book in years, but when you were first doing the, the first audio book, I read it again. I'm like, these, these guys are, are funny. These guys yes. are obsessed. <laughs> they, they're scene <laughs> stillers. What's they, funny they, about them? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's, it's, 
I mean, this is true with a lot of my books. It's they're they're so old. I haven't read them in years, and so this has caused me to go back and read them. And I'm like, hey, if I hadn't read that book, I would have really liked. If I hadn't written this book, and somebody gave it to me, I would actually really like this book. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, that's the best self compliment there is right there, man. That's awesome. Uh, that those scenes, they stole the scenes they ran, man. They were, they were definitely show, show stealers. <laughs> Cause you, you're right. You have this really melodramatic scene, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of angst going on. And then you get these two guys and you're laughing your butt off. Uh, I had so much fun narrating their scenes. Uh, it, it, I kept looking forward to the next one. And now I've gone and, and discussed everything about them there is to discuss, so there goes, I should have saved that for later. Still got favorite. their dialogue. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that they were the hidden characters, but everyone else is hiding in plain sight. I mean, you'll have uh, Peter, who is like, hey, Jack, you're my buddy, okay! And then, like, he goes around the corner and he's like, you son of a bitch, like, I'm, yes. I'm, gonna, I'm report, I am have, have a tape recorder on my chest, and I'm going to report you to the Inquirer. And then you got Maria that's like, here's some punch, I love you! My love for you is forever. I will kill for you. And then you just have like all these characters that just turn the corner and they're just betraying, backstabbing, uh, recording. And then you have people that are like trying to hop on other people's schemes. And you're just like, you're wondering, uh, how could any of these people possibly be Freddy? Because they're all nasty people. I mean, like, what's what's exactly. left to add? And then you start questioning the the main character because you know there's nothing bad about her. She's the only genuine pure character and then you start to think that maybe the host has another personality maybe and it just there's there's so much floating around this and there's so many red herrings that you're wondering who it is and I, I was glad that it wasn't one of those mysteries where a character who got like two words of dialogue turns out to be the killer because that mm -hmm. just that's not a twist that's pulling a random person in the background yeah. and saying they're the killer but in this book everyone is is a suspect and has evidence supporting that. Um, so, yeah, that, that was nice. And it doesn't take long for the proverbial crap to hit the fan. Right. And we get all these extra people get cleared out. and uh, <laughs> no, Literally and, you know, the other way. Yeah. And that's when the, the book really takes off, in my opinion, is... When you're, when everybody's kind of coupled off, going through the mansion, and I gotta ask you about one particular thing. Uh, me and Sean were, were saying we're gonna ask you about this. Where did the robot Freddy come from? Because <laughs> that that was another red herring, another another misdirection. Because like, as, as a Freddy, chapter, it's tires and bolts. As a chapter ends, you think it's either you know Freddy's. They're coming up on Freddy, and here we go, and then. You know, the next chapter starts and uh, Robot Freddy. I had started, actually, I got the deal for this book series the day I started working at Disney Interactive and started my video game career. And so I wrote, well, let's see, so this is the fourth book. So I was well into my, into my, my career at Disney at the time. And because we had silver passes and, and, and it was easy. I was at Disneyland like every week for one reason or another. And so I'm surrounded by animatronics the whole day. I think I'm, I'm really into uh, Imagineering and had been to Imagineering and seen some things that, that were behind the scenes. And so the whole, I, at some point I was just like, well, duh, of course there has to be an animatronic Freddy, a, 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 a guy this rich um, a, in this city would who's going to put on this spectacular party would have a robot freddy in his house it gives a whole new meaning to that video game five nights at freddy's mm -hmm. you know about those animatronics that come alive yep. they're like bears and stuff uh but yeah so yeah I, that that was my defense because somebody was like robot freddy why would you know and i'm like he's a rich guy living in living in springwood uh and I can, because he was going to prank people all night. So that I, I wish we could have seen how that prank was going to play out. It probably would have been pretty damn good. Um, but yeah, we're going to play a clip of uh, this little misdirection by Mr. Bergantino here. And uh, here it is. Uh, our character's coming across animatronic Freddy. Freddy Krueger, not the bear. <laughs> 
Rachel carefully edged her way out of the guillotine room. When she had tripped over Jack, she had come only inches from branding herself on the door. So she steadied her breathing, stood carefully, and shifted herself into slow motion. Jack was hurt, but it wouldn't help him if she went too fast and incapacitated herself in the process. As a result, it took her some time to navigate her way across the room, even with her safety lights on. Occasionally, she called out for help, but gave up after getting no response. Others must be leaving, and on a night like tonight, even with the lights out, cries of terror were just part of the scenery. Rachel didn't see a soul until she reached the top of the ballroom stairway. Light from the outside illuminated a motley crowd heading for the exits. Security staff with flashlights guided people out of the mansion. Rachel flew down the stairs and ran for the first people she saw. Doug, Laura, you gotta help Jack. The benevolent Bonnie and Clyde turned to her. What's wrong? Laura asked, instantly alarmed. Jack and I were, were in one of the rooms, she said breathlessly. And when we tried to leave, he, he tripped and fell and hit his head. He's bleeding badly. Rachel began to cry. I would have gotten down sooner, but it was so dark. I was afraid of falling. He's bleeding. He needs help. Slow down, Doug said, grasping her shoulder to steady her. Which room? The Elvis room. I'll be right back, he said to Laura. Laura nodded, and he pushed his way through the crowd toward the exit. It'll be all right, Laura said. Rachel wiped her tears and tried to pull herself together. Doug returned with the flashlight. Okay, one of the security guards is calling an ambulance. But we're so far from town, Rachel pointed out. Right, so we're going to go up there ourselves right now. Let's go. They retraced Rachel's steps back to the Elvis room. The light made the going easier, but without full illumination, they still couldn't race. Finally, they reached the Elvis room, and it was empty. See? Rachel said, pointing to a dark spot on the floor. He was lying there. That's his blood. Without hesitation, Doug stooped down and put his fingers to the stain. It sure ain't motor oil, he said gravely. He must have wandered off. We have to find him. Rachel's voice was rising again. He didn't go toward the ballroom, Laura said, or we would have seen him, unless he knows some secret passageways in this place. In a place this big, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think so, look, Doug said, pointing with the flashlight. Droplets of blood traced a path to the next room. Rachel darted forward. Hurry, he's hurt badly. Throwing the door open, she peered into the blackness beyond. Bring that flashlight, Doug. Doug appeared beside her and shined the light into the room. Empty. The blood drops stopped halfway across the room. Check the display, Rachel told them. As Doug turned his flashlight toward the platform, Lori began sniffing the air. Do you guys smell something? she asked. Before either Doug or Rachel had a chance to answer, the flashlight beam fell upon a pair of shoes on the platform. All three pairs of eyes watched as Doug swept the flashlight beam up to illuminate the figure standing there. Jack? Doug called out tentatively. But at the sight of the charred red and green sweater, they knew it wasn't Jack. No! said Laura. All three froze in place. Before them, his burned face snarling with rage, a lethal claw raised in the air ready to strike, stood none other than Freddy Krueger. It's all right, Doug shouted. It's just a robot. Laura didn't seem to hear and continued clawing at the door to escape. At the sight of the lifelike robot, she had screamed hysterically and tried to run. But in her panic, she couldn't seem to open the door. Doug ran to her and wrapped his arms around her. It's all right, Laura, he said firmly. She continued to struggle in his arms. Tears flowed down her cheeks. Rachel looked in astonishment at Laura and then at the robot. It was a frightening sight, but Laura seemed almost unhinged. We have to get out of here! Laura cried. Then, looking fiercely into Doug's eyes, she whispered hoarsely, We have to get out of here right now. It's okay, Doug said softly. Then he turned to Rachel. I'm sorry, we have to go. What about Jack? Rachel demanded. He may be hurt. 
We have to leave, Laura told her, a wild look in her eyes. You should leave too. Jack will be all right, Doug said. He's probably downstairs looking for you. Besides, the ambulance will be here soon enough. Why don't you come with us? I'm not leaving until I find out what's happened to Jack, Rachel said, her voice quivering. Something had happened, and her friends were abandoning her, and abandoning Jack as well. Okay, Doug told her. Clearly, he knew what Rachel was thinking, but his priority had to be getting Laura out of there. But will you please walk us out to the car? I, I won't feel right just leaving you here in front of this. He nodded his head toward the Freddy Krueger robot. Okay, but let's hurry. Yeah, so that was really fun to see that play out. Just like all all the different um, parts of the haunted house that were here. I think the only thing that could have made that more interesting is if like Michael Myers had been there, because like Michael Myers is Halloween. <laughs> but you know that that never really got, that never got played out in any of the Michael Myers books. You know, because I mean, they, one of them did have a party, but that none of that cool stuff happened. That was just. Yeah. Yeah, Scream Factory. Like, they set this thing up the whole time, and then nothing... I think one guy starts to sing a song, and, like, the everything turns there was off. There no description. There, were, there was nothing. I mean... <laughs> yeah, the whole book, uh, David, uh, was, like, talking about how this guy's band is, like, so good. They're, like, the best band, like, totally. Mm-hmm. And it's all this buildup, and they, like, their music hits, they get, like, one or two lines out, and then, every, like, all the electricity goes out. And it's like, yeah. there's all that buildup. And that's it. Well, well, if you like, if you like chaos, you like murderous chaos at a party in Hamlet. My my later book, Hamlet Two: Ophelia's Revenge. I take the party vibe and the monster destroying a party vibe to like eleven. You should check it out. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's and there's a band and there's a band that plays the whole time. Okay. <laughs> See that that's uh, that whole series. I, I left you a comment recently. That's on my uh, personal reading list. Uh, like, because I don't get to do a lot of personal reading, but I've been making time for it lately. Oh, in my right. Time, and those are going to be the first ones I do. And because uh, that's that's right up my alley. Um, that's the kind of stuff I'd really dig. Um, so, Sean, you want to start taking us through uh, how we start marking suspects off our list here in the story? Okay, well, I'm going to name a suspect, and I guess we'll talk about uh, what happens to them. So, right. we, got, we got Ron, the best friend. The best friend who helped Jack out of his depression and helped get him back in the spotlight turns out to secretly be betraying him to steal all of his riches. So, what would you think about that? Is, that? is that based on anybody in particular, or just uh, just another character design? It's it yeah no I, I I don't think I ever really had riches to steal for one thing, um, but uh, it was it's 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 an archetype you know the the best friend who who really isn't your best friend and again especially in this entertainment construct where everybody's trying to get a little something something for themselves friends right. like that who needs enemies mm-hmm. that 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 trope. Um, so, Sean, what did you think of his exit from the list? Thought it was just fitting. <laughs> <laughs> it would have, if it would have just just been a knife in the back, you know, that would have been uh, would have been complete uh, circle of karma there. Um, what was your favorite kill in the book to write, David? I, honestly, it's the polar bear. Okay, second, because I, I should have known polar bear is like top. That's my favorite. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, your favorite uh, Freddy kill, per se, um, possessed person kill. Oh, geez, probably. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be disappointed. But I think probably the dumbwaiter kill because I like it, that one because I. I, I set it up purposely so that you thought something else was going to happen, and I wanted I wanted to I wanted to stretch out the tension of that scene, and that's why it turned into what it what it is. So that was fun because I knew I knew that that I could have taken the easy way out with that, and I yeah. didn't, and I think it was more fun as a result. It kind of reminded me of Final Destination. Um looks could kill the book where there's this one character who gets sucked into the sewer 
and he's about to drown, yes. and he's going through tunnel after tunnel, and I, you think he's going to drown, and then he gets out, and he's like, I'm alive! I'm alive! He gets hit by a subway. Yeah, you know, now that you mentioned it, those were also big at the time. I can guarantee you that I was influenced by by the Final Destination films. Uh, in terms of the, you know, nothing was as simple as a knife in the back. It was two, three, four, five steps to actually kill someone. Um, in the end, we got a person, we find out who was possessed, you know, the whole time. But there was another character that was doing stuff, and I never understood that. Was she, were they just under manipulation from him, or...? Yes. So, so what I did for the first time was, and to help with the misdirection of who who was who was uh, Freddie, was yeah. I brought back something that wasn't in the other three books. That's a core Freddie power, which is to influence people in their dreams. Okay. And so, so there's the possession factor. That's you know two, <laughs> um, and and actually being within them. But then there's Oh, that's right. We forgot. Freddie can can influence people in their dreams and 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 screw with them that way. So I brought that in specifically because at this time point, I figured somebody's going to figure out who Freddie is too early. Yeah. Especially if there's only one character who's Freddie. Even if I make all of these characters um, kind of kind of uh, you know irredeemable in some way. Um, somebody's going to figure it out because there's all the formula so far has been there is one Freddy. And then I realized, well, what if I had two? Well, how do I do two? And I was like, duh, I, I, I do. I, I, I have Freddie influencing one of them the way Freddie would through just, just, just through mind manipulation and dreams and not, not through full possession. So that's why that's in there so that there's just a little bit more complexity to figuring out, you know, which, which shell the P of Freddie is hidden under. Yeah, it definitely caught me off guard because I thought I had it figured out, you know. <laughs> and, uh, which we gave a spoiler warning, so uh, Sean's going to go ahead and reveal the character for us. And uh, we'll get into the end here. It was the mummy serving punch. Maria then turns out that Ron is actually influenced as well, right? And uh, when Freddy makes his appearance, we get... A really awesome, and I and from what I've seen in the book so far, I believe this one has the longest uh, Freddy sequence out of the other ones because um, it's a pretty badass scene. If this was if this was the going out book, the final book, you went out with a bang, like literally, which mm -hmm. we're going to get into here in a second. Um, but that last fight was cool because you know we could sit here and go over every single character, but you know. You can listen to it or spend thirty eight hundred dollars and get you a copy. Um, but yeah, I definitely recommend this one. But yeah, so at the end, Freddie makes his reveal, and we got Jack. We got our we got our two. Uh, we got the guy and the girl, the main characters here, and they're gonna have this final battle with Freddie. Um, we usually play short clips here, but what I'd like to do is just play this whole clip out. It's kind of a long one, um, but it's such an awesome everything from the beginning of it to the how it ends with a bang and then we're going to discuss that after the clip so uh here it is because uh, this is really unique for freddy i think you're going to enjoy it uh the final battle with freddy uh after he makes himself uh revealed when his friend ignored him completely digging his fingers into the wound across his throat a wet tearing sound followed as ron peeled his face off much like Jack had done earlier with his latex Phantom of the Opera makeup. Only this was not makeup. Ron tore off his own face. Beneath it resided the face of a monster, wet with blood surrounded by a tattered frame of flesh. A burned, scarred creature leered out at them. Trick or treat! growled Freddy Krueger. This time, it was Rachel who acted without warning. With the hand that had so desperately been holding on to Jack, she pulled him into the passageway behind the exhibit. She caught a glimpse of Kruger's face as they fled. He watched them with devilish amusement. Where does this go? 
She barked at Jack, who seemed stunned. Back in the room, Kruger started laughing. The sound filled the passageway, surrounded them, threatening to drive them mad. Around the outside of the rooms, back to the top of the ballroom staircase, he finally answered and took the lead. What was that? he asked desperately. Are we hallucinating? Has the gas gotten to us? I don't think so, Rachel told him. What they had seen was beyond comprehension, but she did not doubt its reality. We have to get into a car and drive out of here. You still have the rifle? Yeah, for whatever good it will do us against... that? Maybe, Rachel responded. But if we can get outside... When we get outside, she corrected herself, we may get a chance. Are you any good? Actually, yeah, I went to firing ranges all the time in L.A. Maybe the rifle won't be effective against Kruger, but it's better than nothing. What was Freddy Kruger, and could he be killed? Somehow, Rachel didn't think so. But there must be a way for them to escape, or by now, no one in Springwood would be left alive. No teens, at least. Here we go, Jack said, pointing out the exits. They emerged on the landing opposite the entrance to the haunted mansion. Taking the stairs two at a time, they ran down into the ballroom. If they reached the exit, they were home free. But Freddy Krueger appeared at the ballroom entrance. He had carved off the remainder of Ron's skin, but ribbons of flesh still clung to the tattered, striped sweater he wore. Leaning against the doorway as if without a care in the world, Freddy addressed the gleaming blades of the claw at the end of one hand. What? No last dance? I was really looking forward to... Cutting the rug! With the metallic clicking, Freddy scissored the blades together, several times in rapid succession. Jack and Rachel froze, trying to decide what to do next. Luckily, Freddy didn't seem like he was in any hurry to dispose of them, though he did turn and face them. Homecoming turn into a bit of a nightmare? He asked Jack. Turning to Rachel, he asked, Your reunion with your dreamy old boyfriend, not so dreamy. He started to walk slowly toward them. His claw dropped to his side. They backed up, each eyeing possible exits. Freddy saw them and was amused. Maybe you can get out that way, he teased, pointing with the claw. Or maybe that way. Each time he reached out, they jumped, further amusing Freddy. Poor Maria had been dreaming about meeting the famous Jack Spider since she first laid eyes on you. And with my help, she managed to keep her obsession hidden for quite some time. So when things didn't work out the way they had in her dreams, can you blame her for getting a little out of sorts? You manipulated her, Rachel asked. Freddy snarled. Don't get the idea you're buying time, little girl. Any time you have left, I'm given to you. He gave her a withering stare, then smiled grotesquely. I manipulated all of you. She was the easiest because she was off balance. Then there was your friend, Ron, who had planned such a nice little coup. At Jack's look of disbelief, Freddy laughed. Oh, he was no more your friend than a black widow, my little spider. I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you all about his scheming when you join him in my boiler room, because that's where you're going, straight to hell. With that, he lunged forward, swiping at them with his blades. They jumped back, but did not run. Just seeing if you were on your toes, Freddy laughed. Ron has been mine since late this past summer. He was sleeping on the job, which is a bad idea around a gas leak. It's the kind of thing that you don't normally wake up from, if you know what I mean, he chuckled sinisterly. But I must admit, it's been a gas to be Ron all this time. Rachel was stunned. According to what Freddy was saying, he'd been guiding events leading up to this evening's massacre for months, and all the while he had been inhabiting Ron's body. 
"'We can't win,' she whispered softly to herself. Freddy, who had driven them into the center of the ballroom, smiled. "'Now that's the spirit!' He held up his gleaming talons. "'Time to give Freddy his treat!' His voice was low, seductive, but still horrible. He reached forward, holding his claws point up underneath her chin. But Jack had other plans. Taking advantage of Freddy's distraction, he flipped the rifle so he was holding the muzzle and quickly swung it at Freddy's claw. The butt of the rifle struck Freddy's wrist, nearly shattering as it drove his hand downward. Freddy roared with rage. In another deft move, Jack grabbed the gun forward, nailing Freddy in the stomach. He doubled over, but before Jack could pull the rifle away, Freddy's unclawed hand shot out, grabbing the rifle in the center. His fingers quickly worked their way toward the trigger. The muzzle of the rifle now pointed directly at Jack's chest. Freddy's gnarled finger squeezed the trigger. Jack braced for impact. But nothing happened. The safety was on. At that moment, Rachel overcame her paralysis. With all of her might, she drove her foot into Freddy's side. By reflex, his hand dropped away from the rifle and clutched what should have been broken ribs. But Rachel had no such hope that she had caused that much damage. She only knew that Jack could now pull the rifle free of Freddy. Take it! she yelled. He immediately yanked the rifle away and the two ran off. They both knew that they had to get out of the house immediately. If Freddy didn't get them, the gas would soon. It was only by sheer force of will that they had survived this long, but their will was fading. It suffered a further blow when they heard Freddy bellow with rage. He spoke no words, but simply roared furiously. If he caught them again, there would be no more fetishious smiles, no more grandiose toying. In that sound, both Rachel and Jack heard the promise of their own painful deaths. Still, they made it to the front door, and outside, the fresh air seemed to sharpen their minds immediately. Acting quickly, John locked the house from the outside. The steel-lined hardwood security door would prove at least an obstacle to Freddy in his pursuit, and there was no question he was pursuing them. A series of crashes, large items being flung outside, marked Freddy's progress through the mansion. From about a hundred yards across the lawn, they heard the sounds of Freddy attempting to break through the door. They turned and faced the mansion. If we try to run, we won't make it, Jack said. Rachel nodded. There seemed to be no real escape. The realization was the downside of their new clarity of mind. Inside, brains clouded by a lack of oxygen, they had found some reason to hope. Now there was none. Even the sight of her car nearby gave her no hope of escape. They could drive away, but Freddy, now unleashed, would follow and bring destruction along with him. Thunderous booms emanated from the front door. Even from a distance, its buckling was obvious. And in the next moment, with a tremendous crack, the door exploded forward, and framed within the doorway was the menacing figure of Freddy. Jack dropped to his knees and flicked off the safety of the rifle. He drew a bead and fired. Freddy jerked slightly, but did not fall. I hit him, Jack said hopelessly. Maybe if I hit him in the face. His eyes narrowed in determination, and he pulled off another shot. This one fell short, striking the wreckage of the door. As the bullet careened off the still reinforcements, sending off a tiny spark, Rachel got an idea. Jack squeezed off another shot. This one appeared to hit Freddy in the left shoulder, but it only slowed the monster. Jack, Rachel said, as he took aim again. I have an idea of how to stop Freddy, but you may end up losing everything in the process. He looked at her, trying to read her mind, but failing. In the distance, Freddy marched forward, inexorably. Will it get me killed? He asked matter-of-factly. I don't think so. He considered her uncertainty, then fired at Freddy again. This time, he seemed to hit the monster squarely in the chest, driving him back several feet. He was still within 30 feet of the front door. Will it get you killed? He asked much more seriously. I hope not, Rachel replied. Then do it, Jack decided quickly. I'm not going to be able to hold him off much longer.
What's the plan? Jack asked, not taking his eyes off Freddy. His slow, deliberate movements reminded Jack of Godzilla wading through Tokyo. The gun he held amounted to a pea shooter against this monster. The sound of a car engine revving to life reminded him that Rachel had never given him an answer. The sound of tires spinning in dirt made him turn. In her car, Rachel took off like a shot, steering straight for Freddy. Damn, Jack thought. She's going to try and run him down. That'll kill her for sure. There was only one thing to do. Rapid firing. He rained bullets on Freddy. If he scored enough hits, the monster might be momentarily driven back into the mansion. And if so, maybe Rachel would abandon her suicide mission. After the fourth rapid shot, his part of the plan seemed to be working. Freddy was forced almost back into the doorway. But Rachel did not slow down. Freddy saw the oncoming car and spread his arms wide, almost welcoming it. That's when Rachel dove out of the car as it sped on a collision course toward Kruger. She rolled across the grass on a divergent path. First, the underside of the car raked against the steel of the door. Then the entire vehicle leapt into the air, carrying with it a shower of sparks. Freddy's hands flew up in an effort to protect himself, rather than welcoming the oncoming juggernaut. The front bumper caught him squarely in the chest, and the last Jack saw of Freddy Krueger was the monster being thrown backwards through the doorway of the mansion. That was also the last Jack saw of his mansion. The sparks that flew along with the car bounced into the entrance, even as the car plowed into it. Later, he would never be able to say whether it was the sparks alone or if the impact ruptured the car's gas tank. Whatever the cause, the gas inside the mansion ignited. The first explosion knocked Jack backwards about 20 feet. The second, third, and fourth explosions proceeded to level the mansion. Jack was driven farther and farther back, finally taking refuge behind one of the remaining cars on his lawn. One explosion rocked the vehicle so violently, Jack thought it would topple over onto him. Then the rain of fiery debris began. At first, he crawled under the car to avoid being struck. Then he remembered that Rachel was out there somewhere unprotected. Well, just like Jason Voorhees, if you shoot him and he doesn't go down, keep shooting until you run out of ammo and then find some more and see if that works. <laughs> and then uh, an explosion is always a good thing to throw in. Um, now, you were mentioning to us uh, this was an idea you had when? Oh, I, uh, I, back when I was writing, you mean blowing him up? Yeah. Well, I mean, by th this time I was, I was getting tired of the books and I literally wanted to end it with a bang. I was like, okay, this is it. It, this has to be huge. This has to be big. I wanted this, this particular story more than the others, I wanted this to feel like it could have been a feature film. And so I wanted it to have this big action movie feel. And how do you end most big action movies? With a giant explosion. And luckily, that, that's a good way to take care of Freddy is, is fire. And, but I had to figure out a way to do it that would not be too boring and, and too cliche and too expected. So, yeah, I put in the whole, hey, I smell gas. And that's, you know, that's the, the seed for what happens later. But then I'm like, well, what do I do? I mean, he's, how do we get the house? I don't want him to just, like, fire a gun and have a spark do that. I didn't want to do the whole, oh, I'm going to throw a candle in there. You know, you want, that all was small. It was all too small for me. And I really wanted something spectacular. I, I don't know what came over me, but this is what I wanted. And then I thought of some time... I was driving on and and scraped at the bottom of my car, and I saw sparks. I'm like, aha, because then we get fast cars in this too, and and I imagine this whole thing of 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 ramming a car into a house in a way that would scrape the bottom of the car and sparks would come out, and that's what would do it, and that's where that ending came from. Is I wanted. I wanted a big explosion. I wanted some, a clever way of triggering it, even if, 
if the gas thing was a little little a little weak and then i wanted a car and a crash and a boom and that's why it ended the way it ended so the whole so this good. whole book is the answer to a question what happened to jack spider's house um <laughs> this happened this is what yeah. this is what happened <laughs> Just like his career, it went up in flames. Um, but yeah, it, it was a very explosive ending. Uh, a lot of people would probably go into this book and be like, wait a second, like a third of this book is just intros to the other books. What? It's short, but I'm telling you, this is an action-packed story. You wouldn't believe the character development you get in such a short story, in such a short book. Um, you're constantly entertained. There's no filler uh, no meaningless text, and uh, it, it's going to be, a, it's a real page turner, like, usually I go like a day or two between uploads, and on this one, I did all four of them, like, I couldn't, I had to get back to it each day, it was like, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I was done, you know, uh, so, it's a great read, if you can't afford the $3,800 copy, you can go to the channel, there'll be a link at the end uh, for the audio book, definitely check it out, I think you're going to enjoy it, um, so guys, Casting the roles of this book into a movie. My only one, my first one I want to say for Jack Spider, this is who I pictured. Young James Franco, like Spider-Man James Franco. Oh, that'd be a good one. That's, that's who I pictured kind of when I was reading it. Young, not not modern, like 45-year-old James Franco, right. obviously. But right, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking uh, 1995 Leonardo DiCaprio as Jack Spider. Yeah. I can see that. I could. I couldn't really. I, I couldn't get a cast on anyone else for some reason. I, I know the thieves aren't supposed to be that old, but I just pictured Joe Pesci and the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Dillon is one of them. Is who I pictured. Oh, uh, that'd be good. From Matt one Dillon? of the thieves, like blob, like blob age Matt yeah. Dillon. Oh, uh, like Kevin Dillon. Kevin Dillon. My bad. Sorry, got it wrong. Oh, I thought you were talking about Matt Dillon. I was like Dillon. So let's, let's just throw both of them in there. They'll be they'll be yeah, the two Dylans, <laughs> the Dylan or, brothers, or the the thieves could be James Franco and Dave Franco. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what, who would you cast? Oh, you said Dawson's Creek, right? That's... Yeah. At the time, at the time, I'd also been. Let's see, was it? I can't tell time. So yeah, so I I, I was probably something like a Dawson's Creek cast was going through my mind, uh, or or. You know, people from from movies like um, like Final Destination. You know, sort of that 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 crowd. If I were casting it these days, I was thinking, like, actually, his friend Ron would probably be like Dave Franco, who can seem really nice, yeah. but he has that ability to turn turn evil. I could see him having that range. What about Neve Campbell for um, Rachel from Scream? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Like, that, not too right. outgoing-ish, but, like, she's got the right angst. Quirky enough, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd, 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 I'd have to say Robert England for Freddy. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know who else I'd cast there, but... Uh, that'd, that'd be really... Yeah. That's good. That's Yeah, good. right? I think that's perfect casting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was going to say the... I, I'm, like, totally having one of those moments where I'm get, I can't remember things... And I love the other guy that played Freddy in the remake. I loved him in The Tick and everything he's ever done. I cannot think about of his name. Jackie Earl Haley? Yes, yeah. Jackie. Yes, Jack yes. Earl Haley. Right. right. Oh, how about for um for Pete uh, Repeat? Uh, that, that dude from that 70s show, Eric Foreman. Okay. For uh for Repeat. I, I, I can't thought you were going to tell me the older brother from Pete and Pete or something. <laughs> no. I was like, <laughs> just keep it, just keep the Pete thing going no that's good yeah corman that's good um so yeah that's our cast uh, casting ideas y'all good with robert england as freddy though right that's yeah okay no, no i don't know if anybody will accept that he's he seems like such a nice guy i know and he, he's got all that if he, classical... if he can do japanese game shows he can do deadly disguise <laughs> what what did we say last week uh he, whenever he was playing freddy uh, he did like uh, he was doing like every little thing he could, like really soaking it up. And what what was it? I made a joke about insurance or something. I don't recall. Uh, oh, never mind, never mind. It wasn't that. It was like a 
like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You know, and Freddie just pops up. Um, but yeah, David, thank you so much for uh, for popping in again and talking about this book. I look forward. I hope you'll come back uh, for each episode we do on these books, man. Uh, we always love having you here. Well, uh, I, I love I, I love being here. Thanks for thanks for having me, and thanks for for enjoying the book so much that you're sharing it with other people. I really appreciate that. You've told and, me before. And, and you're helping me rediscover the books, too, which is super meaningful. So thank you. Awesome. No problem. It, it is so much fun. I, I can't wait to do the October thing and do these back-to-back. Um, you told me before that I should do Virtual Terror next. Virtual Terror is the first book of the series. And I do sort of – you can read them separately and in any order, as we've seen. But there are characters that go through okay. the whole series. What I'll do is I'll do I'll, so it's going to be virtual terror twice burned, and then help wanted. Something, yeah. The other thing, and the 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 other thing, sort of from an academic standpoint is, and 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 it shows in how this particular book, Deadly Disguise, is 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 leaner than the other books. It's you can see where I started, like with the pilot episode. Okay. And then how I refine the style and and the, the the concept throughout the next two books, and then you know sort of sort of landed on the most efficient like pithy way of doing these books in Deadly Disguise. Yeah, I thought it worked. I thought it was perfect. Perfect. I, I don't think it was too short, and I thought it was just a great solid story. You know, it kept me it kept me coming back to it each day. Um, I didn't want to stop. You know, but I didn't want to put out like you know, for the individual uploads, super long one, so I had to stop, right. but I didn't want to stop. Um, oh, uh, the, other, the, the other thing about uh, A Virtual Terror is it has, of out of the entire series, minus, minus blowing up the house, um, it has my favorite kill of the entire series. Okay. I look forward to that, for sure. And, I, and that's another one, the plot has me intrigued. Uh, I will say the one that's got me the most intrigued is the plot of Twice Burned, uh, from what I read. Uh, it seems like a reincarnation type thing or something. Oh, yeah. That one I kind of go into sort of mysticism and new agey stuff with Freddy. So okay. I have a tendency to, to t- kind of take something like that and, and then throw, you know, stab knives through it. Well, what type of crystal would he use for healing? <laughs> It, it, whatever is sharp enough to stab someone in the face with. <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did we ever tell you our thing, David? It, we we, we want to see want somebody someday make a fan film or a real movie where they pull Freddy into the real world, and the first thing he does is not go on the attack, but just start screaming in pain <laughs> you know, from all the burns and everything that he's right, seen. Yeah. Nerve damage. Oh, my God. Um, but if I uh, – rating time – I gotta say, for what the book is, if more books were written this way about these slashers, it would be a lot more entertaining. I think we'd have less bad reviews because you didn't it's a give lot us of fluff unnecessary that's books. unnecessary, hundreds of pages of fluff that that yeah. really brings down a rating. This one was just a perfect story. There was nothing thrown in there to fill pages, and you were entertained from beginning to end, so this is one I'm going to have to go five on. Five out of five. Five out of five over here. all the marks. <laughs> cool. Thank you. And trust us, we've, uh, we've had... It, it was awkward, but we've had authors on where we didn't give it a five. <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, it was, it was I remember. I'm like, I'm like two for two on the fives now, so I got to really hope I, my, my, I had my game on when, for the next three books. I just hope that we don't ever like somebody's like, screw you, and just turns off their camera, you know. Um, no, but it, seriously, it's just such a solid story. You know, it hits all the marks uh, that it should. And the, the the Freddy aspect for people that's just in it for that, they're going to really enjoy it too, you know. Um, so, yeah. Any uh, closing remarks, remarks, Sean and David? No, I think that just about covers it. Um I mean, like you said, we didn't we didn't 100% talk about everything, but that's going to be for the people who read the book so they can see everything. Like, I know Freddie talked in the intro. He talked in the epilogue, too, and I like that, love that, too, but I'm not going to spoil any of that. It's going to be something fun for whoever listens to this book yeah. or reads this book. So, I love what he does with the characters, what he says they're up to in the yeah. 
Uh, yeah, especially repeat, poor guy. Um, any closing remarks, uh, David? Um, nothing. Just, just thanks. Thanks again for having me, and thanks again for 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 bringing these books to to people and in, into today's audiences. It's, it's a blast. Thanks. Thank you so much for your blessing on doing that, because uh, it's a lot of fun and people really appreciate it. And uh, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, we're going to be heading over to After the Slash. If you're a patron, we'll see you there. If you're not one yet, uh, you can sign up for as low as two bucks per month. Uh, you get the uh, weekly exclusive After the Slash podcast, early access to certain narrations, free merch, uh, free ebooks, voice characters, and some of these if you want. Uh, so much cool stuff, and you'll be helping the channel. Um, you heard him say how much that book costs, you know. <laughs> so it's it's not a it's not it's a very expensive thing uh, keeping this channel going, keeping the material there. Uh, so I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much for listening. Be excellent to each other out there, and uh, we'll see you next time. This is Sean Campbell saying, "If this one doesn't scare you, you're already dead." You got a you got a thing yet? Yeah, I got a thing. I got a ah. thing. This is David Bergantino saying, "Keep it real, keep it scary, but most importantly, keep it real scary." Nice.